recording. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're going to spend a little time uh, talking about the program updates for the PPL program and what's new for phase four and what's not. And to fill you in on that, we have me, I'm, uh, oh, Brandon, next slide, please. I'm uh, Janie Anderson, the program manager. Um, also with PSD, we have Laura Almendinger, the program coordinator, and Brandon Cornell, the marketing manager. And we're very pleased also to have Greg Holiday with us today to talk about heat pump water heaters. Greg introduced the first Energy Star heat pump water heater for GE in 2009 during his 32 year career. And he spent 13 years educating on heat pump water heaters with the Bradford White Corporation, head, headquartered in Ambler, PA. And we'll hear from Greg shortly. But let's start with uh, phase four. Uh, next slide, thanks. So this phase started June 1st of last year and will run for five years till May 2026. Uh, we're still at 15% savings over code for our qualification and the incentive rates remain at 30 uh, cents per kilowatt hour for a HERS rated home with an, with 35 cents per kilowatt hour for any home that is also uh, Energy Star certified. The big news uh, for this phase is that the incentive cap has increased from 2,500 to 4,500 per home. Uh, next slide. So, um, a lot of these things remain the same from the last phase. All homes must have a HERS rating from a certified rater. Uh, when we started the phase in June, uh, we had to have everything in the REM rate version 16.1.1 or greater. Currently, uh, everybody is pretty much in 16.3.2, and that's what we recommend at this point for now. Um, to qualify for the Energy Star tier, single family projects must now meet Energy Star 3.1. And the multifamily projects are in a little bit of a transition right now. So if you have older uh, multifamily projects with permits, permit dates prior to July 1st of 2021, they can still qualify if they meet Energy Star 3.1. Moving forward, they will need to qualify at the new multifamily 1.1 for Energy Star. Next, next phase. Um, we we do require that all the participants um, must apply again for the program for phase four. If you participated in phase three, you still need to reapply for the current phase. Most people have already done that, but if you have not, the link uh, is there for um, signing up for the new program and we'll distribute the slides uh, later. Um, also, we're asking all builders to provide an updated version of their W-9. That needs to be on the most current version of the IRS W-9 form, which is 2018. And we do need uh, to have a, a current date and signature. And um, now I'm gonna turn it over to Laura. So continuing and what's new right now this isn't directly correlated to phase four but it just went into effect last month the iecc 2018 code had an update specifically referring to air changes this went into effect on valentine's day although there is a six month grace period to allow everyone to adjust the code change has changed from five air changes per hour to three and this ties in nicely with the program because if you're already paying someone to come to the homes and do testing to verify code compliance, then 
you might as well take advantage of that expertise and um, use that energy rating to qualify the, for the program and you can earn incentives which will help offset the cost of the testing itself. So as Jane mentioned, the cap per home has increased up to $4,500, which is a significant increase. So some of the ways that you can increase your savings and take advantage of that increased cap are to build homes with a tighter envelope, use air source heat pumps or ground source heat pumps, I mean, presumably one, and instead of gas furnaces or other forms of space conditioning, and to install heat pump water heaters, which is what we're gonna get into more of going forward. Next slide. So heat pump water heaters are kind of a new and exciting option, um, not specific to the program, but something that we're starting to see more of. And so far, we've seen increased incentives for homes using heat pump water heaters in the range of two to nine hundred dollars per home typical uh, increase incentives have been in about five to six hundred dollars but it will vary based on each home depending on the size of the home that it's used in other energy features that are involved and the differential will be based on what equipment would have been used otherwise if not a heat pump water heater such as a gas fired water heater so uh, consult with your rater or contact us if you have any questions about this or would like to know kind of how to incorporate this and increase your incentives. And uh, now I will pass it off to Greg Holiday, who's going to tell us a lot more about APOP water heaters. Fantastic. Somebody can make me the presenter. There we go. We get the right screen up here. And that should be right there. One second. You tell me when it's populated correctly. There we go. That's good. All right. Welcome to my farm in Kentucky. I'm a Kentucky grown boy. I've got 22 and a half acres and it's kind of cold and rainy here as I'm sure it is with you guys today. Uh, I sure appreciate the opportunity to be the, the person that gets to educate you on heat pump water heaters. This has been a passion in my life now for 13 years. Not one that I knew I had, but it's one that certainly got cultivated. Uh, I'm a ground source heat pump guy for my house. I've had geothermal for 30 years. I've got both a horizontal and a vertical system. so. I can attest to how well that works and maybe that's what's given me such a passion for heat pump water heaters too. Uh, I worked for GE, I helped introduce those first water heaters. Now I work for Bradford White because Bradford White bought the GE operation and moved it. So my years of experience is not just with what I'm doing here today, but in 13 years of observing and seeing the industry and knowing what everybody in general has been doing and how this market has been growing. So we're gonna talk about why heat pump water heaters are so significant to the US in general, how they use the same principles of refrigeration to move heat rather than creating heat, uh, proper site selection, making sure that you're putting them in the right place in the house, uh, because there's a lot of misinformation out there about where they can and should work. And the good news is, is they work in almost every, every time the same spot that a standard electric water heater or gas water heater would have been today. We'll talk a little bit about service requirements because somewhere down the line, somebody's going to call and may call you back during that first year and say they've got a question on something. Uh, your after sales support, where you're going to reach out to the manufacturer. But mostly, I want to be able to teach you guys how to tell the story when you put this feature in a house. And then finally, if you don't know this already, a heat pump water heater is one of the least expensive things you can do in a home to earn somewhere between three and six. It's really more four to seven HERS points. Have your HERS rater punch in the UEF uh, for a heat pump water heater and watch what happens when you see how many points that earns because that's, that is generally a big surprise when a, a builder can see that if you're following the HERS rating. Now, 
this whole thing began way back in 1992 with the Department of Energy creating the first ever Energy Star rating system for the country. And they started with the biggest energy users in the home. Uh, they started actually with computers, but they moved to the biggest energy user in the home really quick when they went to the HVAC side of the country and said, can you guys build a product that's 10% more efficient than what you make today? And it took them from 92 to 95 for HVAC products to become Energy Star certified because they had to be significantly more efficient. Uh, water heaters, on the other hand, being the second highest energy user in the home, got a free pass until 2009. And that's because the standard gas and electric water heaters that have always been used have always been less than 100% efficient. And there was no way other than changing insulation in a tank to slightly give any of those an increase to even create an Energy Star rating. So they just didn't do it. Well, it took GE creating the first heat pump water heater commercially sold that took the principles of a refrigerator, which is a heat pump, and a tank that existed and put those two things together to blend them and create a brand new product. Now you went from a water heater that was less than 100% efficient to a water heater that was going to be 200% efficient or higher, and today they're 300% efficient or higher. Now we'll let that soak in for a second. 300% efficient or higher means that you get $3 in hot water for every $1 you spend to heat water. That's something a home buyer cares about. And you know that because you already put the higher sear factor HVAC system in those homes. You put better windows in. You have an energy story that you tell, but more than likely to this point, you've never been able to support it with an Energy Star water heater, and especially the highest efficient water heater that exists in the market today. All other water heaters are less than 100% efficient. This water heater in general saves about 3,000 kilowatt hours a year. If you look at the energy guide on a standard electric and compare it with a heat pump water heater, depending on the manufacturer, it's 3,000 or maybe just a little bit more kilowatt hours less in operation because moving heat is cheaper and easier than creating heat. So they are becoming the preferred choice by homeowners as they learn more. And trust me, they're learning more now than ever because the gas side of the, of the country is being effectively changed because of California. California is saying we want to get 93% of our homes that are on gas water heaters off of them. And we want half of those to be switched in the first 10 years. That's where we are right now. California is unhooking from the gas pipeline and saying we don't want any more greenhouse gas emissions from our homes. So we're going to take out all gas products, all gas infrastructure. That's creating conversations all across the country because every major city, for the most part in the United States, now has carbon reduction goals. So it's not a matter of when this is going to hit or if it's going to hit Pennsylvania. It's a matter of when it's going to become effectively a standard. So being able to talk about the fact that you've got a non-carbon producing water heater that happens to give you $3 in hot water for every $1 you spend is a plus. So it's Energy Star rated, it's an electric heat pump or that, that is the most efficient option available today, and it will pay for itself. And I'll show you exactly how that happens here in just a moment. So the big question is always, well, Greg, how does this work? And do they provide the same volume of hot water? Do I have to size them differently or do something special for that? And the answer is, is that heat pump water heaters deliver on two promises. One, they will provide exactly the same volume of hot water as a standard electric tank of the same size. So if this is a 50, a 65, or an 80 gallon tank, an electric water heater and an electric hybrid heat pump water heater have the same ratings on them when it comes to volume and recovery of hot water. They're identical. So you don't size them any differently. The difference is, is in how it works. A standard electric water heater only has one option when it comes time to heat water, and that's a 4,500 watt heating element to turn on. Whereas the heat pump says, I can move heat by just turning on the compressor first. Now, I want you to think about this as you would your refrigerator, because every home has got three to four, maybe five heat pumps in the house already. They just have different names to them. A refrigerator is a heat pump. You put warm items in a refrigerator, and the refrigerator's job isn't to make that food cold. It's actually to extract that heat, and it dumps it at your feet in the floor. 
That's why there's a grill across the bottom front of every refrigerator out there. The warm air that gets taken out of the inside gets blown through the kitchen by the fan and the evaporator in the bottom or the condenser coil. And it continues to do that over and over again until it takes the refrigerator down to about 34 degrees, 35 degrees. It'll take their freezer down to zero. This water heater says I do the same thing, but in reverse. I'm drawing in some warmth in the air around it, warm being anything that's above 35, 40 degrees, pulling that air across the evaporator, attaching that heat to the 134A refrigerant, and then releasing the heat by wrapping a hot condenser coil, hot enough that it would burn you if you touched it, around the outside of the tank under two inches of non-CFC high density foam. So it's able to heat that tank using nothing but the heat pump with 550 watts of power, not 4,500 watts of power. But we do leave the heating elements in, all manufacturers do, so that if the water heater is tested by the 13 year old in the house that says, my job is to use every drop of hot water there is, when I get in and the water heater says, I've got five sensors on me that I can run an algorithm and decide when to switch from heat pump to resistance heat, and when Junior gets in the shower and starts sucking all the hot water out and it changes the temperature so drastically, what I'll do is turn off the heat pump and activate the upper heating element just like a standard electric water heater does. So the recovery time is the same. They then turn off the upper element when that's satisfied and go to the bottom heating element and turn on the heat pump with the, at the same time and recover the bottom 60 to 70% of the tank. In that operating mode, that hybrid mode, is where they're Energy Star certified for every manufacturer. And that's the operating mode where you see the energy guide that tells you how much it costs to operate. So you're changing the operation and how a water heater works. You're dehumidifying that space by uh, uh, two, up to two quarts of moisture a day. And you have a slight cooling effect, which we'll talk about more as well, of about three to five degrees in the area where the water heater is located. Now, Studies have been done for the last 13 years by virtually every major utility across the country to prove that that has no adverse effect that's measurable that you could change on a home having a heat pump water heater. And that's primarily because of where they're located. They're located most often in a basement, sitting next to the HVAC, in a non-conditioned space in a conditioned home envelope that says the reason that furnace room is always the coldest part of the house in January and July is because it's eight feet underground. And that ground temperature is pressing in that free heat from the earth. It's gonna be somewhere around 50 degrees, 55 degrees. And it says that room's gonna be the coolest room in January and July. And the water heater says, I can use that heat. Now your, your registers, your, uh, your supply lines and your returns are all upstairs in the house, never in the furnace room. You're not heating or cooling that space. And your thermostat is always upstairs as well, which means that even if that room is three to five degrees cooler when it runs, it's not turning anything on in the house that's causing a reaction. You always know your basement is cooler when you walk down any time of year, but you don't generally do anything in the furnace room, especially to try to compensate for that. And you also wanna remember water heaters don't run unless you're using hot water. So it may run for three hours in the morning, off all day long because this tank is insulated to an R19. They only lose five degrees and 10 hours of standby, which means when you're not home, heat pump water heaters don't run. And then they may run three to five hours in the afternoon and evening because we tend to spread out the hot water usage that we have then. So you're looking at a product that says my first line of defense is heat pump because moving heat is cheaper than creating heat. I use only 550 watts, a fraction of energy to heat that tank all the way to 140 degrees, the same way that a 4,500 watt heating element can do. And it's smart enough to decide which way it's gonna go to make that happen. Now, the proof of all of this when it comes to payback is you look at one number. It's called a UEF. This is the Department of Energy's efficiency rating for water heaters as they're tested in the same test chamber for every brand, every style water heater, a 68 degree room with 57 degree water simulating uh, draws for a 2.5 occupant home. A standard gas tank water heater that's been used for a long, long time tests out at a 0 0.60 UEF. That means it's about 60% efficient. You lose 40 cents of every dollar you spend to heat water 
in a gas atmospheric tank because you can feel the heat coming out of the top of it. So now you bump up to a, an electric water heater. Well, all electric water heaters are UEF rated at 0.93. At 0.93, that means I'm losing about seven cents of every dollar I spend to heat water. So then somebody says, well, let's move up to a tankless. That's a better option. It saves more money. It does. You start at a 0.82, 82% efficient, and you top out at about a 0.97. You lose less. You do. But you also add a maintenance bill to a tankless gas water heater that says somebody's going to have to clean this and descale it every two to three years. And what I saved off of that, I now reinvested in the maintenance of the product itself. Tankless gas water heaters have one purpose in life and they do it very, very well. Never take a cold shower. And if I'm dad and I got four kids in the house and I'm the one taking the cold shower at night, I want a gas tankless water heater. But that's far and few between the people that actually need it versus people that just think they want one. And a lot of times I'll even ask them, were you running out of hot water on your previous water heater? And the question is like, no, I really wasn't. Well, you put a tankless in, why? Well, saving space is one valid way to do that, but you can look and see all of these are below that line for payback. Now you look up at a heat pump water heater, 3.39 UEF says you save over the cost of a standard electric water heater about $300 every year. And a heat pump water heater has a 10 year warranty life, not six, which is what every other form of heating water has. So in the course of that 10 years time, guaranteed, the homeowner gets their entire investment back if they went out and bought one and had a plumber put it in. But when it's part of the home package, now you've reduced that operating cost of that house by $300, 3,000 kilowatt hours a year, just by putting in an Energy Star electric water heater. And oh, by the way, only heat pump water heaters are electric Energy Star water heaters. Standard electric water heaters can never qualify for that. Now, the proof really does show up in the energy guide itself. $419 a year is what a standard electric water heater costs. Doesn't matter who the manufacturer is. A heat pump water heater is going to cost around $110 to $115 a year, depending on the manufacturer. And that's for a 50 gallon. $172 a year, $171 a year on a 65 or an 80. And then if you look even down at the bottom left on your screen, a 0.63 UEF gas tank water heater. Gas is cheap as a commodity, which is why that number looks better than a standard electric water heater, but it's still losing money. And a heat pump water heater overcomes the cheapness of gas today with highest efficiency possible uh, and says, I still cost less than that. Look at a tankless, uh, a 0.90 UEF is about $170 a year versus the heat pump water heater at $110, $115 a year. This is what the homeowner sees in the house. And when you build a house and you talk about efficiency and you talk about windows and insulation and air exchanges and the heating system, you also want to make sure you step that homeowner to see the water heating choice that you made, that it is an Energy Star and it will actually pay for itself. Now, here's a broad look at all the manufacturers. These are the three main players, I should say, for a unitized heat pump water heater that's all one piece. You've got Rheem, and Rheem sells under the brand names of Rheem, Rude, and Richmond, and they've got four different layers of this product. They started a UEF of about a 3.55, and they go up to a 4.0, depending on which model you choose. $104 a year for the least, or the highest efficiency model, and $110 for the others. You've got Bradford White in the middle, and Bradford White operates under one name, Bradford White. In fact, it happens to be the only heat pump water heater that's not sold in retail, just two plumbing contractors through a distributor, 3.39 to a 3.48, $115 a year. Uh, I will point out that the connections are different on each of these. Rheem and A.O. Smith, side connections, Bradford White, top plumbing and electrical connections. I will also point out on the A.O. Smith, $114 a year. Uh, there are 3.42 to a 3.48. Uh, all of these have 10-year warranties. All of these are sold in wholesale. Two of them are sold in retail as well. And you'll want to notice as well where they're, they're manufactured because heat pump water heaters are manufactured in many different countries around the world uh, and Middleville, Michigan, <coughs> excuse me, as you'll see there with Bradford White.
This is a picture of a typical heat pump water heater plant. It happens to be mine because it's the only one I could get a picture of. Uh, companies don't typically want to put things like this out for somebody to see. But Mexico, China, Germany, uh, Middleville, Michigan, these are the typical locations that you'll find heat pump water heaters. But I wanted you to be able to see it's a standard electric tank with a condenser line wrapped around it. So really what this becomes the art of is you being able to tell the story that it saves. It really does save. This is, this is hard numbers when you look at an energy guide. That it fits in the same place in the house so you're able to use it. That it provides the same quality of hot water, which is why you're putting it in. And it has a longer asset warranty in the home. How often do you get to put a water heater in that says, I've got a 10 year warranty on all the parts, compressor, condenser, evaporator, tank, even the heating elements, and it reduces emissions. So all of these things are gonna add up to a homeowner that says that's the one I would have bought myself. Uh, and the fact that it pays for itself, that just sells it all the way down the line. And you know, the thing you always have to consider is what if your competitor puts this in first? And what if they're the ones talking about having an Energy Star heat pump water heater, and now the homeowner comes to you looking for prospective buy and says, what are you putting in? Water heaters are just not something they typically pay any attention to. But California, as I said, is drawing a whole lot of attention to this product now. So the fact that it pays for itself, some builders make this an inclusion. Uh, I'm doing a lot of multifamily work right now. I'm seeing an uptick in that in the industry where it's just going straight to a heat pump water heater. But to be able to use it even as an upgrade and show the homeowner, if you let them see the map, we can put this water heater in and that's included with the house or for a few dollars more, you can put this one in and cut your annual operating cost down by $300 a year. And it's going to cost you this much more. And you can do the math and say, you'll get all that money back in three years. That's usually what it works out to be about three years uh, for the upcharge. It may even be less than that. But being able to walk them through that second highest energy user platform and how you chose this product and then play that right into your green efficiency story for what you're doing with your house. So where can you put these things? Pretty much anywhere a standard electric water heater is today. You can go for the basement. You can go for the laundry room. The laundry room is a great spot as well because you've got a, a moisture and heat producer and a dryer and a heat pump water heater that says, this room is normally the warmest room of the house all the time, summer and winter. I'm gonna use some of that heat and increase my efficiency. You can put it in a garage, as long as that garage is a, uh, a space that does not freeze. And a lot of houses are insulated in a way where that garage is semi-conditioned and stays above the freezing temperature. So any of those places are even a closet. A 36 inch closet on a 50 gallon water heater gives it seven inches space around it for a heat pump. And then you put a louver door on the front so that it can breathe into that next room. So what's the same is the same volume of hot water that each of these products is gonna be able to put out for a 50, a 65 or an 80. They're designed to fit in the same footprint and they have the same essential connections for White puts connections on the top, Reem and A.O. Smith on the side. So there are some difference in installation on that part of it. Uh, and they all use the same 30 amp electrical connection uh, as well. Now, when you, what's different on these is we do need air for every manufacturer, 700 cubic feet of air. That's a 10 by 10 by seven room. If you've got a room that's going in that's a, a lot, I'm sorry, a furnace room, then you say it's that big, nothing has to be done. That's perfectly adequate. If you put it in a smaller room, then you want a louver door that breathes into a larger space and then allow the water heater to make the exchanges for that. The service recommendations vary depending on the manufacturer. Generally, seven inches around it is what you'll want for serviceability. Uh, Bradford White wants seven inches specifically because this water heater can be fully repaired in the home, including the sealed system. There are some instances where manufacturers will say you can put it zero clearance right up against the wall. Since you're doing new construction, I would never recommend that you actually do that. You wanna make sure you leave enough space so that 10 years from now, whatever that technology is, it's able to easily be put in. The only thing different that you're gonna do for a heat pump water heater is have a place for the condensate drain water to go. Now, unlike tankless, this is not acidic. This is water you can drink. It's, it's just like the HVAC, in fact, the HVAC condensate and the heat pump water heater line are often tied together in installation. So that's the only thing different that a contractor would do 
in installing a heat pump water heater. It's, it shouldn't take him 20 minutes longer, 30 minutes longer to install that part of it, but it's the same setup for a tank if he does that. Uh, there's only one point of maintenance for a homeowner and the water heaters for all manufacturers prompt you as to what to do, and that's clean a filter. So if the filter gets dirty as a result of somebody running a saw in the basement or in the garage, the water heater says, I'm measuring the airflow as it goes through. And if it gets blocked, what it's going to do is beep to get an audible tone and blink the light to get their attention. Now, if the filter gets clogged up so bad, it will actually switch off from heat pump and switch to resistance heat. So the homeowner still has hot water, but it's going to beep and blink until somebody comes down. You squeeze the filter on the top of this one. The other manufacturers are on the sides or the back. You take it to the sink, wash it, shake it, put it back in, press and reset, and now you're all set and ready to go. These are the typical installations used by a manufacturer. Uh, you've got Bradford White on the left here with the top connection and how that would look. Uh, you've got a ream in the center there with an installation uh, that shows the side connections and some of the nuances with having plumbing that goes all the way to the floor. And then you've got an A.O. Smith on the far right, again, showing some of that same thing. I apologize for some of the uh, uh, graininess of this. I, I had to reduce the file size on this down so that I could email it. And I didn't realize that it disturbed all of the words as much as it did. Um, but this is how they would typically be installed. And contractors are, are not typically um, too rattled when they see any of these changes. In fact, you should expect any manufacturer's product that you're working with for that manufacturer to come in personally uh, or have someone locally or do a webinar like this to meet individually with your plumbing contractors to get them on board. Uh, because a lot of times plumbing contractors think these don't work and they'll say, it won't work in the cold market. It's too, you know, it's too cold up here in New England. And I have had more fun with that statement in 13 years than anything else I ever get to do because I just tell them, look, I'm a Kentucky boy. I don't know about you guys up there in New England, but we put our water heaters in the house. Where do you put yours? Doesn't really matter how cold it is outside when the water heater is in the conditioned space, in the basement, in the laundry room, in the garage. It's in a protected spot. So as long as it's got air that's above 35, 40 degrees, the water heater will operate as a heat pump hybrid water heater. If it happens to drop below that for a short period of time, all manufacturers products will use the standard heating elements that are still in there and they still provide hot water for the home. So I don't want you to think anything about that, but I do want to make sure that you understand contractors, we need to get them on board. And the only additional thing you have to consider in installing a, a, a side connection water heater is it does have to have a vacuum relief valve. So that's one of the things your plumber will need to be familiar with uh, if he puts in a side connection product. Now, we talked about clearances. Most of this is related to replacement, but I want you to see it because sometimes people think this is a real big deal having a zero clearance water heater. Generally, that means the space is just too small and somebody said, I got to put this in there anyway. Heat pump water heaters need air. And I always remind contractors, if you put one in a zero clearance situation, it becomes highly likely that if anything ever has to be done for service, that the water heater is going to have to be drained, disconnected, pulled out, and worked on. But if you leave that seven inches space around it on all of these manufacturers' products, they can be serviced in the home. And that's really what you want to do is make sure a contractor can get in there and do the job if he needs to. Now, we talk about service. I want you to consider this. I can't see your hands to know what, whether you would be raising them, but you probably got a refrigerator in your garage or you know somebody that does. It's 15, 20, 25 years old. And I always ask you, that's the one with the beer and the soft drinks in it. How many times has that refrigerator ever been serviced? And the answer is almost, I could have a room of 50 people in it and the same thing happened, none. It's never been serviced because refrigerators have been around for a long time. You've probably got three of them in your house if you count a freezer, a refrigerator, bar refrigerator, wine chiller, all compressors, condensers, and evaporators. And the same thing when it comes to a dehumidifier. And you're in a market where you use dehumidifiers. That's a compressor, condenser, and evaporator. That's how you extract moisture. That's why these dehumidify when they run. Those are items that have been around tried and true for a very, very long time. 
very simple technology when it comes to that, and they're extremely reliable. The heat pump portion of this uh, is the, the least likely thing to ever have a problem. Now you got tanks, you still have to deal with the water situation in wherever market you're in. Gas tank water heaters typically last longer than, I'm sorry, electric tank water heaters typically last longer than gas because gas water heaters have a 45,000 BTU blowtorch blowing up against the bottom. Electric water heaters just have heating elements. All of these products, because they don't have a blowtorch, the tanks will last longer. And the heating elements in the water uh, are guaranteed even for 10 years on those parts. So you're looking at something that's very easy to service, very familiar with the plumbers for the tank portion of it. And if the plumbing company also happens to do HVAC work, they can work on the top section of it as well. If not, then a refrigeration guy, the same guy that would fix the refrigerator in the kitchen, can work on this or the HVAC guy for the house because this is far less complicated than some of the HVAC systems that I see going in today. Now, each of these products have venting capabilities, and you're going to have somebody talk to you about that, and it may even be your HERS rater that says, I'm not sure, but I think that cooling effect, we need to vent it. And if that's the case, I would want to talk to them, because there has not been one study in the entire country that has said that heat pump water heaters need to be vented. The only reason you see a vent is one of the prominent energy uh, efficiency groups uh, in the Northwest thought they were going to have to rate these to have a vent. And after they did a one-year study with two test houses, they printed a report out that said there's not enough of cooling effect in the home to warrant making any changes, and they took the venting requirement off the table. You got to think about this. If somebody says, well, I want to move that cool air somewhere else, and sometimes dad will say, I want to move that to my workshop because that's going to cool it down, and it's a, it seems to be a warm place in my house. And I'll remind you, what time do you usually work in your workshop? Well, I'm usually out there about eight or nine o'clock at night. I said, well, then you might want to line the kids up and make sure that they're all taking showers right about then because the water heater has to be running in order for it to generate any cool air. And it's not enough that you're going to notice a huge difference. It's just, you're essentially looking at a 5,000 BTU air conditioner. And then you would also be pulling air in from outside. And if it's cool enough outside that it drops that temperature below 35, 40 degrees, it's not operating as a heat pump. Let it operate in the environment that it's in and just know and trust that after 13 years, no utility in the entire country or energy program has ever required venting. But all manufacturers have it because we thought the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance was going to require it. And when they proved that it didn't, we all still have a lot of venting stuff to still sell. So some common myths about heat pump water heaters that you may have seen or heard. Somebody will say, well, it doesn't make enough hot water. And I'll remind them, it's a standard electric water heater. Now, if you came to my house here in Kentucky, since it's just me and my wife now, our girls are grown and gone and popping out grandbabies for us, uh, you would see that I keep mine in heat pump only. All that means is that it's going to take it a little longer to recover if I do that. But I make that choice recognizing that when we take showers in the morning and get ready for our day, we don't stand there in the shower or in the bathroom and say, wow, that was so much fun. I think I'm going to do that again. It's not like you need it to completely recover after you've taken showers. And when the heat pump starts to recover, it's only going to use 550 watts in this case, a 0.5 kW draw. So if it runs for three hours, that's 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5. That's one and a half kilowatt hours to recover that tank. Whereas a standard electric water heater says with standard heating elements, I can recover much faster. I can do it in an hour. Yeah, but you're drawing 4.5 kilowatts because it's a 4,500 watt heating element. So I could recover real quick and have nobody there that even needs the hot water. So we like to educate the homeowner on that portion of it and the contractor so that they can properly advise the homeowner. This is a generator safe product. If I've got a generator on the home and the power goes out, the generator kicks on, I can go to an electric heat pump water heater and change the operating mode to heat pump only. A 0.5 kilowatt draw, it's five and a half, 100 watt light bulbs essentially running and the generator says, now I can heat your water just the same. Some will say that they're challenging to install. Well, you know, this particular one has a top connection. It's not, it's exactly the same. But in new construction, even for the sides, that wouldn't be a problem. Uh, so they won't work in cold climates. Actually, they do. 
uh, as we've talked about, heat pump water heaters, no water heaters are typically outside. Uh, they make too much noise. Well, they make some noise. A, point, a five, five decibel, 55 decibel range or less. 55 decibels is about the same sound level as a dishwasher in the kitchen. Now, if that water heater's in your basement, it's like saying, I go downstairs, can I hear the dishwasher run? Most people never even notice it because it is a fan noise. That's all it is. Uh, there are lots of gas water heaters that make far more, far more noise than that. That it won't work in a garage, well, as long as the garage is above 35, 40 degrees, it will. You know, that you have to prevent the condensate from freezing, no, because it doesn't remove moisture during the winter months, so there's no concern of that even if it's in the garage. Uh, that you need to be a refrigeration technician. I've had contractors tell me that. I, I don't have an HVAC license, Greg, I can't put those in. And then I look at them and say, did you have to have a license to plug the refrigerator in your kitchen? This is the same thing. It's already a sealed system. There's nothing that you have to do other than hook it up. Or they'll say, well, it costs too much. They are more expensive. They're over twice the cost of a standard electric water heater, but they pay for themselves in energy savings. All of that money comes back and you're getting an incentive for putting this in just because of the three to five hertz points that it's gonna earn for you. So there's not gonna be the same upcharge that you would have as a homeowner would have, and the homeowner is still gonna love you for putting this in. Service procedure, there's two parts to this, as I mentioned, about 70% of the things that could happen to a water heat pump water heater are not even sealed system related. They're related to heating elements, they're related to sensors, uh, electronic boards, things like that. So know the manufacturer that you partner with. Um, Bradford White provides 24 seven technical assistance for contractors. AO Smith and Reen both have toll free numbers as well, but they do have specified hours. But I always tell a contractor, you're not gonna know how to work on this really well for a long time, because there are guys out there that have been putting these in for a year. And they'll tell me, I've never had to service one and I've, had, I've put in 50 of them in this past year, and they all are working just the way they're supposed to. So most manufacturers teach and train that after the sales begin, after they start installing them, and when they start seeing any type of a service call. Because you can teach somebody something, and if they never use it, they lose it. So it's better to gain that experience. It's very easy to call and talk to a manufacturer standing in front of the water heater and walk through the diagnostics and understand just what needs to be done. So hopefully I've timed this just about right that you guys can come on and I can uh, I can either give control back uh, at this point and see everybody and you guys can ask me some questions because I know you surely have something that you want to be able to talk to me about uh, with questions on these. So Jane, Laura. So can we, um, people can put questions in the chat or um, also yeah, it looks like we did have a few questions that came in, um, but I can let maybe we'll have Brandon deliver his piece on marketing and then at the end we can wrap up with questions just to make sure we're good on time. Okay, okay. Um, so we're, we're back where we left off here. I want to thank Greg for sharing his expertise. That was a ton of useful information. And just want to reiterate here, um, there, is, there is plenty of incentive money available to, um, to cover some of the cost of the upgrade to the heat pump water heater and how much of that will, uh, will vary. But uh, you can speak to your rater or talk to us and we can give you an idea of how much that might be. And um, now I'm going to uh, turn it over to Brandon to talk about the marketing support that's available to help you sell your high efficiency features. Hi, everyone. So the marketing team here um, working on the PPL New Homes program, we, we put together a number of resources, I think, that can be of great value for you to communicate the work that you're doing in building a higher quality home. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff you do kind of goes unnoticed, right? It's it's unseen. It's high quality that kind of is out of sight. Um, so we're trying to put together some resources that you can use to communicate, uh, you know, the, the better home that you're building. So one of the one of the newest items we have right now is this 
co-branded home buyer marketing sales sheet. So this is just a, a one sheeter that you can use to talk about the project features in each home. You can, uh, we can update it to include your HERS score, uh, what percentage savings over code the home comes in at, any of the features that you're featuring, like a ground source heat pump or a heat pump water heater. So all of that can be included on here. You can uh, go a little deeper with some of the other homeowner benefits of just greater resale value, a uh, higher level of comfort, comfort and durability. All of that you know, can be communicated on this uh, one sheeter. We're also able to update it with your company logo, provide your contact information, and then also include a photo of your home or unit. Another item that we've, we've had this one around um, for a little while now, but just wanted to call attention to it again in case you're unfamiliar, but we put together this energy efficiency sales signage. So this is intended to be utilized uh, within a home during a home tour, uh, uh, maybe like a parade of homes or realtors could even util access this uh, with your team. So it's just, again, another uh, tool that we're providing to communicate that quality that's out of sight. Uh, some of the, the items that can be featured or included are calling out comfort through, you know, your deeper insulation you're providing, uh, natural light just through high performance windows, greater control through effective air sealing, high performance through your duct sealing that you're getting tested by uh, participating in the program. And then also that peace of mind through the third party verification uh, with working with your rater. So something to be, you know, thinking of, please reach out to us. Uh, we can also co-brand these for your team uh, with spring coming up. I know it might be parade of home season soon. So uh, just a great time to reach out so you can uh, take advantage of this this spring. And then lastly, we have the builder showcase. This is on the website. You can apply to be featured straight from the website. Just include a picture of the home, the energy efficiency features. Uh, if there's anything special you want to call out about the home, we'll feature it on the website. And that's just a, another great uh, attention grabber that as home buyers are searching for things online, sometimes they end up coming to our, our program page and are looking for builders and doing a little more of their research. And this kind of is a value add for them to feel confident in working with you. Um, so please, uh, we're looking for new homes that we can include on this right now. So we'd love to see some things submitted here soon. And that's all I have. So we can probably go back to our questions. Okay, we had a few questions came in about the heat pump water heater technology. The first one is, have the recovery rates improved over earlier iterations of the technology? Well, the recovery rates have still been the same. Again, it's a standard electric water heater. Those, there are myths in the market that some people will say, well, a heat pump water heater takes longer to recover. Not if it's in the hybrid mode. In the hybrid mode, they operate on an algorithm that says we're measuring ambient air temperature, we're measuring tank temperature, and we're measuring each individual component to see how efficiently and effectively they're moving that heat. And if those numbers start to get out of bounds, it switches from heat pump to resistance heat. So the recovery is exactly the same. If I have it in heat pump only mode and I make that conscious decision, then I'm saying I'm okay with it taking longer to recover, but it doesn't take longer to recover in the hybrid mode. And if somebody has got some information they wanna share with that, I'd be happy to talk with them even more, but it's that is that is a myth that you not take longer to recover. Um, the next question is any information on how a recirculation loop affects the efficiency rating? The research system will cause it to you. It will be still remain efficient, but it will cause it to use more electricity because you're reheating water more often. Uh, Ream, I believe, is the only manufacturer that says no to research systems. Uh, Bradford White says yes, and I believe A.O. Smith does as well. Now, the caveat to all of this is it has to be a smart recirculating system, not one where you say, I'm going to turn this, this uh, research loop on, 
and it's going to be thermostatically controlled to maintain 120 degrees in the line, essentially creating a radiator in the home all the time. I see that happen, and then I get calls and somebody will say, my water heater seems to be running all the time. Well, yeah, if you're using floor heating essentially like this, that is what will happen. But as long as you put a smart system in, something that says, I've either got a timer, and I'm asking the homeowner, what time do you generally get up in the morning to take showers? Well, we take showers at 6 o'clock. Well, at 10 minutes to 6, we're going to restart the line for you. We're going to set a timer for that. And if you do something else in the afternoon or evening, we can set another one for that too. Or you put a proximity sensor in the, the bathroom, the master bath, that says anytime somebody walks in, we're going to restart the loop. Or we're going to put a button underneath the countertop and says when you tap this in the morning or anytime you want to use hot water, it will restart the loop on demand. That's what every utility, every manufacturer is going to require. Uh, again, except A.L. Smith, there's, there's some differences in their algorithm and they prefer not to use recirculating systems. I'm sorry, Rain, not A.L. Smith. Well, what is that? Mixer yeah, I back. think in our um, program, we're mostly seeing the recirculation loop set up in multifamily buildings more than in, in residential. But it depends on the size of the house. You know, if you get a house that's got a, Water heater on one side, which is what I have. My water heater is below me where I'm, I'm above my garage right now. And our master bedroom is 70 feet that direction. So that's a lot of pipe to have to purge with cold, with cold hot water or cold water in a hot water system at that point to make it all hot again. You can use mixing valves as well. One of the ways you compensate with any water heater to get more out of it, because gas and electric water heaters don't respond the same, a 50 gallon gas tank water heater will put out more hot water than a 50 gallon electric. So you always make sure that your plumber is properly sizing according to the home and the fixtures and the number of occupants and the number of bathrooms and things that you have. But what you can do is you can put in a, a slightly larger tank because you're going to size it correctly. It's not that you're compensating, you're sizing electric differently than you do gas. Then you can put a mixing valve on top, which allows you to now jack the temperature up on the water heater. Most people don't know how hot the water is in their house because the water heater they have doesn't tell you. All it has is a little knob or a control that says 120, hotter this way, cooler this way. A heat pump water heater has an electronic control board on it and measures temperature changes in one degree increments and allows the homeowner to start at 100 degrees and go all the way up to 140. So if it's not hot enough as a result of leaving it at that anti-scalding 120 degrees, we expect the homeowner to go down there and punch it up, 22, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now let's see if this is hot enough for us. And if they put a mixing valve on during the installation, now you just crank them up to 140 degrees, and that mixing valve dials it down to an anti-scalding temperature for the whole house. The hotter water in that tank will last longer because you use less of it to mix with the cold water to dial it down to the right temperature. Uh, states like Vermont, every house has a mixing valve on it. Every one, and they crank them up to 140 degrees. That is a state requirement. So that's very commonly done. What else? We had one more question that I think you actually answered after the question came in. It was about um, how loud they are. And I know you said it about the same as a dishwasher. Yes, and I, and I want you to remember that because this is an interesting thing about this industry. I can tell you that ours is 55 decibels because that's where GE tested it. There is an appliance testing protocol for sound for vent hoods and dishwashers. This says you got to have a test chamber that's this big and it's got to be a soundproof test chamber and then you put the microphones this far away from a dishwasher or a vent hood in order to get a comparison with every other manufacturer. There is no protocol for testing sound on water heaters. Water heaters have never been measured. So if I tell you mine is a 55, it is a 55 according to the industry standard for appliances in the dishwasher in the kitchen test at 55 or a little bit less now. Um, I don't know what the other manufacturers, what they're following. Everybody has a DB rating. Uh, just know that the, none of them are, none of them sound like any more than a fan when they run. It's not like these are obtrusive sounds that you hear. A furnace can be louder than that. Uh, a gas water heater with a blower on it can be much louder than a heat pump water heater. 
This is the sound of a compressor running and a, and a slight fan noise, and that's all it is. What else, guys? Those are all the questions that came in. All I'll right. throw one in. What it? Um, so you said Bradford White has top connections, and it's and the other two manufacturers do not. Can you speak to why? I would assume you would agree the top is better at that point. <laughs> GE designed this water heater, and again, Bradford White bought the design, bought the plant, and moved it to Middleville, Michigan. So it is the only American-made heat pump water heater. But GE designed it to be a replacement water heater for the 50% of American homes. Half of American homes have electric water heaters. So imagine what happens when half of American homes switch from a water heater that uses 3,000 more kilowatt hours. They put 300 bucks a year in their pocket. What to do to the power grid? It starts to draw down those duct curves everywhere. What we never saw and anticipated happening is that California and some of the gas conversations that are taking place would say, well, we want these now too. So a heat pump water heater in California is, a, is very close to being the only water heater that you can put in. This year they can still put a tankless in and heat pump water heaters and tankless are actually par. Next year, tankless water heaters will have a penalty and heat pump water heaters will go up. And I expect in the next two or three years, they'll just ban gas tank water heaters and tankless water heaters altogether. So top connections means replacement is fast and easy. If the water heater in the house has top connections, you take one out, you put one in. But it's also what contractors are used to even for new installation versus on the side. Now, why GE did that uh, and was able to pull it off is because you've got 12 inches from the top of the tank to the, through the heat pump to get out the top. And my engineer said, do you know how hard it is to keep those oriented perfectly so that if you're off a fraction at the bottom, they don't look like they're tucked into each other when they come out the top? That was an engineering feat that we had to solve, put 12 inch extensions in. And our competitors came out shortly after us and just went straight to side connections to also use that for mixing better in the tank. So it's just different designs. Thanks. So we have another question. We have a couple more questions that have come in. Okay. One is funny. <laughs> Someone says, so this is the newest version of the old GE red and white R2D2 water heater? Well, <laughs> this is GE started off with a model that looked like um, the, the, the robot off of Lost in Space. And some of us are old enough to remember that robot with the arms that said, warning, Will Robinson. It was one that was actually made at a plant we had in China. After a couple of years, we brought production to the United States and introduced the red model that you saw at Lowe's, uh, I'm sorry, Home Depot that we sold there. Uh, I'm sorry, Lowe's, I get that straight again. We sold other water heaters at Home Depot. And when GE got out of the water heating business about five, six years ago, Bradford White, who was private labeling from GE, hired me and then just bought the plant and picked it up and moved it. So it is the same, it's the oldest tried and true design. Now there have been three iterations of that since that was first introduced, but this is the longest design in the industry, continuous design with the longest track record uh, that shows how it works. Thank you. And then it looks like we have one minute left and I wanna respect everyone's time. So in one minute, can you explain how the efficiency is higher than 100%? Because moving heat is cheaper than creating heat. It's like saying, if I put 200 pound weight on the ground and I tell you to bend over and pick it up, the energy you're going to exert to bend over and use every ounce of strength you have in your body and pick it up is gonna make your knees buckle 200 pounds. But then if I give you a rope and a pulley, then you say, wow, I can pick it up with half the energy pulling. And then I give you a block and tackle pulley with two and you say, look, I'm picking up 200 pounds with one hand now. I'm accomplishing the same task, but is my energy exertion the same? No. And that's what happens when you move heat. I can use a compressor, condenser, and evaporator to pull warm air across that and attach it to Freon gas and then compress it. And now it starts at a warm temperature and gets exponentially hotter. I only use 550 watts of power to achieve that same task that a 4,500 watt heating element has to use directly in the water, generating heat. That's how it works. 
Did I have a follow up on that? <laughs> no, I think we're we're good and we're at time. So, so thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, if you have any additional questions, feel free to contact us. And uh, this has been recorded, so um, that will be available later. And if you could send out my contact information to them or provide that with me, then I'll email them. And that way, if they have other questions, they can reach directly out to me. OK, we can do that, definitely. Thanks to Greg, and thanks to everyone for attending. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone.